Hello everyone, welcome to the Tech Point Africa podcast. Today, we'll be discussing Kenyan insure tech startup, Pula, and uh, its Series B raise. We we'll move from there to the challenges that Starlink is facing in some Southern and Western African countries. Then we we'll move from there to giving you a lowdown of Sim Shagaya's Onibaja Fund, as we promised you a few weeks back. I'm Uluwani Femi Kolawale, and with me in the studio today is... Bolo. And Tim Gosrim. As usual, we have an interesting guest with us in the studio today, also. But before I introduce him, I want to give you a heads up on something we are... A new thing we are introducing to the Tech Point Africa podcast. Every week... We'll be giving you insights um, into some, or uh, we'll giving you some data about certain companies or industry, depending on whatever happened that week. And we are doing this in collaboration with Intel Point. Intel Point is a research and um, an intelligence platform that give, that provides um, data and carries out research on different industry, um, including tech. This week, what we'll be sharing is multi-choices, revenue, and profits, and trading profits since its IPO'd in 2019. So far, it has experienced, it has realized its highest revenue of 9.1 billion rand in 2023, while the trading profit was 10 billion rand. We'll share a link to the insight in the description. Don't forget to check it out. Let me introduce the guest we have in the studio uh, with us today. His name is Temitokpe Adeyemi. Temitokpe Adeyemi is the founder of Pay As You Use Insurance uh, or Insure Tech Startup. And he's joining us in the studio today to talk about something interesting about another insure tech startup that raised. Um, welcome to the studio with us, um, Temitokwe. It's great to have you with us. Hi, um, my name is Temitokwe Adeyemi and I work at uh, PayU as um, uh, the CEO uh, and I'm glad to be here on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Temitokwe says he works, works at PayU. <laughs> He's the founder <laughs> of PayU. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Let's let's just go straight into the story <laughs> of today. <laughs> I mean that that is that is such an interesting way to introduce us. <laughs> I, I will copy it when I finally start my own startup. Start up. <laughs> I work at. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. So let's let's go. Let's just go into today's story. And we are starting with Pula, a Kenyan insure tech startup that has just secured a $20 million um, fund in Series B. Mm-hmm. Now, the focus of the um, of or the goal or the focus of this startup is to provide insurance for farmers against pest diseases and um, um, what other things, pest diseases and any other natural disasters that they might encounter. Now, we might say fundraising, fundraisers have not been that common recently, but yes, we do fundraising and but we are wondering why did this get to Tech Point Africa podcast? There's something interesting that is worth talking about today and um, Chim Gozrin is going to share that with us in a bit. Okay, a little more than a bit, sorry. <laughs> so, first is um, they are raising a Series B, so mm-hmm. which we've not seen a lot of um, in the last. <clears throat> we've not seen a lot of Series B um, raises in, in the Africa. last two years. Yeah, in Africa, we've not seen a lot of that in the last two years. So that's one. But more importantly, would be the uh, would be the product. So yes, we have fintechs who typically typically raise most of the money. But we also have the problem with insurance in Africa, mm-hmm. low insurance penetration. Um, and we've been talking about this low insurance penetration for a while now. Yes, we even have we a haven't. report on that from Intel Point. Yes. For Nigeria's insurance space. Mm-hmm. You can go check it out. Um, well, yeah, we've, we've talked about it for so long. 
without um like let's like say a lot of progress being made we still mm-hmm. have i think under three percent in most african countries so what they are doing isn't just insurance like maybe motor motor vehicle insurance or life insurance they're insuring agriculture and for me why i think this is big is uh i mean if you're in africa in most parts of africa your country is probably experiencing some food inflation mm-hmm. if not very serious in nigeria food inflation is really high and it's been the biggest driver of our inflation figures in the last two years. So it it shows that we need to seriously start thinking about, one, how we improve agricultural output, and not just improve output, but also how we, how we mitigate losses, um, because losses are like common in the agricultural sector. So how do we mitigate it? One way is insurance. Um, in the last 10 years, over... 100 billion dollars has been lost by farmers mm. um, either to flood, drought, or maybe changes in the climate. In Africa, yeah? No, globally. Globally. Um, yeah. Africa is about 10 billion. We've lost about 10 billion. Looks like a small number when you compare it to the um, global agricultural That's GDP. However, the context is that you guys do not have like a so very you robust. Saying you guys. Y- okay, yeah, fine. Africans. Africa does not have a robust, um, we don't have a robust agricultural sector. Mm-hmm. So, our contribution is really small. We have, I think, 17% of our arable, um, arable land, but we do not produce up to, I think, 2% of agricultural GDP. Well, by the way, that's by the way. Um, so, yes, it's important that we start thinking about it. In Nigeria, for example, farmer um, clashes, farmer uh, headsmen clashes, mm-hmm. um, you can call it terrorism, there's banditry, mm-hmm. there's climate change yeah. that has become a major problem in the last few years that is now affecting our output so crops are not being produced as frequently as they should mm-hmm. output is lower and we have small older farmers largely um, but, um I'm really eager hmm? to hear how Paula solves, solves these problems yeah. okay yeah. like i'm trying to set the background for all of this mm-hmm. but what i'm trying to show is that the agricultural space has like there's a whole lot of problems that need to be fixed mm-hmm. and if you can fix those problems, you are not just, it's, it's bigger than creating money or creating returns for your investors. You are also ensuring that, like you're making a huge contribution. I think it's probably one of the places food, where you can, food. You can grow very but fast. Food is so what does Pula do? Insurance for farmers. Mm-hmm. So your crops are insured. Um, your cattle or livestock is insured. And they have, um, so they use satellite technology partially. Um, they also use um, some AI um technology to ensure that one they can mitigate climate losses because climate losses are you can't uh, i mean if you don't have the tools you, you can't predict mm-hmm. the you can't predict the kind of losses you experience True. as a result of that so they're using that to find out how farmers are going to be affected and then help them but i think what's really interesting is be, they understand that you insurance penetration in Africa in Africa is low partially because people don't trust insurance. Mm-hmm. So they are not exactly selling it directly to the farmer. They are okay. working with partners. All so right. they are working with government partners, pub, uh, private sector partners as well to ensure that the insurance gets to the last uh, to the farmer. So um, embedded insurance basically, or you can call it embedded finance, but I'll call it in, in, embedded insurance. So for example, you're selling seed. I think. I think. The Nigerian government tried this a long time ago, but you're selling seed to farmers and you embed insurance in that. So mm. they buy the seed, but they also buy insurance, insurance for that seed. If you go to them and sell the insurance, it may laugh you off, but if you embed it in the in the seed they're purchasing. So that's basically what um, Pula is doing. And I think it's necessary. They are a Kenyan startup, but they also have um, operations in Nigeria. So the, the, the most popular thing that you will see insurance company focus on with the, in the agri- agri-tech sector mm-hmm. is insuring against losses due to climate change, as you've mentioned, due to pests, due mm-hmm. to... But there's something interesting that Pula wants to do in Nigeria yeah. because, you know, insurance companies have to focus on the problems they are facing to, to insure them against it. So mm-hmm. what is that thing? Okay, so there's the uh, yeah, there's bandit. Let's just call it banditry insurance, which is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So, like I mentioned earlier, we have that problem mm-hmm. um, for Nigerian farmers. We uh, our farmers are not going to the market to the farms as frequently as they would normally do, mm-hmm. and when they do, they are their their produce is like 
being wiped out because you plant and then these guys come, they destroy everything that is in their path. Yeah. So Pula is trying to ensure that, which is a... Uh, it, sounds, it sounds interesting because you don't usually hear something like that. We know that, yes, banditry, terrorism, it's men... Um, that, that's a, probably because evasion. it's like a, a recent phenomenon. We've not... I mean, you didn't grow up here in banditry Yeah, issues. but it's, it's more than five years or more already. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's it's, it's very, very recent. Okay. Yeah, so it it's might be a space that um, is nothing that, but I love that Pula is considering going into it because it was not really delved into in their report. Um, the report you that delved, was sent out from... You delved. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine I said that. But yes, they didn't really delve into it in the report they released about their funding. But we want to make some um, informed informed um, um, guess, guesses or informed... Some educated guesses. Educated guesses, rather, um, about this. So who, that is why we have talked talk, talk with us playing in the insurance space. Um, this sounds like what farmers will really need in Nigeria. But... Um, it's a big deal, but I, I, I don't know if Tim Dogo can share with us the possible challenges that Pula can face in pulling this off. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, banditry insurance to me is more like a, uh, it's more like a product like kidnap insurance, right? Uh, the premiums, the premiums are going to be extremely high that it's not going to be affordable for the intended uh, kind of farmers, right? So let's say I'm a farmer and I have, uh, uh, let's say, 10 hectares of land. I can tell you for free that I will not be able to afford a banditry insurance, right? And um, banditry also covers um, things like uh, farmers, while on the farm, they come carry, uh, pick them up for ransom, right? Uh, that is part of banditry. Uh, or a farmer who has poultry or animal, um, uh, yeah, um. animals, right? Maybe like uh, cows and all of that. Then some guys just come in with guns and matches and all of that and whisk all of those away, right? So the thing is, how do you, how, how will your, actuary determine it's, it's going to be a difficult pricing really it's, it's going to be very difficult because where where is the data that you're going to use to model what's what's data around farmers being kidnapped or they are where or their crop or animals are being taken away where's the data is, we just hear on the news oh it happened mm -hmm. in benue today oh it happened in you know, so it's going to be a difficult thing to price. Uh, for so for that banditry um, layer on whatever coverage are offering to the farmers, I think they should review it. Uh, and I also doubt if the regulator will also give approval for such because uh, even kidnapping insurance is something we've been trying to work on and uh, we're told to shelve the idea, right? Mm -hmm. So, but for other forms of coverage. Like for the crops towards flood, towards drought, I mean drought, um, and all of that, right? And those those make sense that you begin to work with um, government institutions like IITA, where you have improved uh, seedlings, all right? You finance improved seedlings for farmers, so that some of these, um, I mean, some of these issues they usually have around pest pest eating up their their crops and uh, drought and all of that right they can they can mitigate all of those even before those kind of claims begin to crystallize right but of of all the coverage they, they want to offer i think the banditry horn would be the toughest uh, product to offer yeah a quick one if you're listening to us on spotify or apple podcast please leave us a review so th thank you very much, Tim. So you mentioned something um, very critical, which is the data that they will need to make this decision. So um, while what the what they want to offer is 
will be beneficial to the to the farmers. Um, would you say banditry insurance, like kidnapping insurance, like is it too early to the market or is it just something that is out of the hands of insurance companies? Yeah, so I will not say it's too early uh, for the market, right? In fact, we need it. But the question is, can people afford it? Mm. So let's say, for example, um, I own 10 hectares of land and somebody is telling me to pay uh, 700000 for as premium mm. for banditry insurance. And my kids will be resuming school in about two weeks' time. And probably the tuition fee is, um, let's say, one point whatever million, right? I will not go and pay for banditry because I will know that anyways, the guys will still come, right? <laughs> and it is whoever they meet on the farm, they will carry away. So the banditry insurance so the in the first place, you the question you begin to ask is what will be the benefit? Is it that the payout will be paying the ransom mm. or uh, is it that the, the payout will be, you will be paying the ransom that is being requested by the bandits or what exactly would be, because you can't determine for those. So if a bandit kidnaps somebody now, he's asking for 100 million and you, you've collected premium from the customer to um to pay out let's say a maximum of 20 million right so the po policy would not make any sense because this is not something that you know the cause and effect right mm -hmm. you don't know okay if this happened this is the likely you know you don't know so it's a it's a it's something it, it see banditry is government business nobody should try wow. forming a policy <laughs> for it really just respect yourself and get up <laughs> yeah and i mean Pula, Pula is raising this is a series B, right? Yeah. So, so, series B, the parents, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure I, I think they would have they will have some interesting responses to some of the issues that yeah, some the Dogway has yeah. raised because uh, <laughs> like, so those are really, it, really important. Yeah, yeah, great areas. I'm because particularly interested in the cost. So these are valid conversations, right? Um how do you determine premium? How do you determine the actual cost of a bandit coming if they if mm. someone dies it's easy for you to say okay um life insurance yeah life insurance but with something like banditry i mean kidnappers have found pmf with nigeria and we are seeing them so demand ma market fit yes they have actually they, and we are seeing them demand um 20 million for someone you picked on the expressway right yeah so how do you do that i mean do you know how much do you have a range and you if know, you have the, the a range, quality like, of that person's life and the ransom that will be placed on, on it. I mean, they could just pick up one random person, like he mentioned. He has paid 10 million as premium and they're asking for 100 million. Are you okay? Fine, yes, you pay the you pay the 10 million, but how does that help? What if they say, Oh, you now have 10 million because we've seen this happen? Mm -hmm. Oh, you could raise 10 million, or yeah, let's do 200 million. Oh, like, good. So, those are con those are valid, valid conversations, conversations and questions that should be asked um, by Pula. Or that should be asked of Pula. Mm -hmm. But what I'm particularly interested in is the cost to the farmer. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of Nigerian farmers are smallholder farmers. Yes. They do not have a ton of money for insurance. To pay their premium. Now, Even their partners. Yeah, I mean, of course, if you're a smallholder farmer, you're most likely married to a smallholder. Sorry. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. you're not married to a Dangote or Tony Lumelu. Yeah. So they can't even afford that. So I am thinking about how they could work. Yes, they work with partners to ensure that to ensure um, crops. But tell me, um, the question is for you. Do you think that there is? Do you think that they could work with the government, for example, to make this insurance cheaper? And if they can, do you like? What do you think is like the long term viability of this? You are an insurance business, obviously. But how does partnering with the government to reduce insurance cost? Um, how how mm -hmm. does it play out in the long run? Insurance. Yeah, basically subsidize the insurance. How does that work in the long run? Yeah, so thank you so much. So um, I once worked at Agza Mansard, right? And uh, we somewhat do not like to do government business. <laughs> oh, boy. Right? Because uh, for many of the reasons of, yeah. of uh, people wanting to receive tea. Yeah, yeah. People wanted to receive what yeah they call it in america tip we call it in nigeria bribe mm -hmm. right so um people wanting to receive those kind of monies ahead 
and um, the corruption that goes into that and all of that. So I've somewhat developed. Uh, uh, so if you're talking about working with your regulator, that is different from working with yeah, government. government. Yes. You can't work with government as... You can't work with... If you're not Dangote, you can't work with government. <laughs> <laughs> You know who I am. Who are you to uh, want to work with government? Really, uh, are you? Do you want to support government with hiring more police officers and with? Uh, I mean, with required equipment to uh, keep watch over these vast farmlands, or how exactly do you want to go work with government? Because I, I really don't do not understand. So, like I was saying, there's a difference between working with your regulator and working with government those are two different things if you're working with your of course if you know whatever space you're playing you should work closely with your regulator but wanting to work with government in what capacity exactly you're not dangote you're not ten dollar you are not uh uh you're not uh these guys right so uh in what capacity exactly because i'm i'm i mean this this banditry is something the federal government themselves are not solving effectively uh, state government are not solving effectively, then you've raised $20 million in Series B. You think you want to come and solve that problem. I mean, that's just um, uh, an idea that should really be... Per- I, I, I mean, all of the other product lines that... <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, ...want to offer. Okay, so, my, I, I, maybe I can help out I, with where do you want... Where do they want to come in? Um, yes, of course, I don't know how you want to engage. Is it the army you want to engage for banditry? But let's leave the banditry aside, like... Every other thing that they want to do, we have smallholder farmers. So, what are some? We, we have smallholder farmers, like you talked about, but maybe they can work with the Ministry of Agriculture, for example. Um, I mean, hopefully, those ones have a very good database of farmers that they can, like, you have, they should have a very good database of farmers. They should have, or maybe farmer cooperatives and all of that. So, let's say they would be working with the Ministry of Agriculture, for example. Um, in what ways do you think they can work with with them? One to mitigate the problem of cost, and to actually build a sustainable business here, where they are not. I mean, where they are not just subsidizing agriculture for us once more. Yeah. So um, the the ways uh, a startup can can partner because I I think I know a couple of agri tech uh, agri tech startups or agri agri in short tech startups. Yeah, so the way the way I see them work primarily is you partner with uh, like the likes of IITA, like I earlier mentioned, wherein uh, you help with improved seedling. Then in those seedling, you already embed uh, insurance. So let's say seedling is for let's say a seedling costs hundred naira, right? Insurance. Inside of that hundred naira like 15 naira might go to insurance, right? So that when they plant those seedlings and they don't sprout or they don't give the uh, required yield, right? Then the farmer is uh, is uh, remunerated, right? So let's say the required yield is supposed to give you uh, 2,000 naira, but that seedling did not uh, sprout well, it did not grow well and all of that. Then that two thousand era claim will be paid to uh, the farmer. So that's number one. Number two is uh, government should like the trade uh, platforms, the government trade platforms. So what they need to be doing, and of course, InsureTech should also be collaborating with them in doing is looking for a ready market for these uh, products. So uh, a place like Ogbomosho has mango during a certain season, especially around this time. I can tell you for free that 70% of those mango go to waste, right? But if there's an insure tech uh, partnering with some people, either government or some off-taker abroad or wherever it is, right? I'm going to buy your product because you're helping me to make sales, right? So th- these are like, these are like, uh, like, like I usually would tell startup founders within the insurance space, you have to be in that business to know how best to solve their problem. So if you want to do agri-tech, I'll advise you that you have like one or two hectares of land, plant something, mm. 
by that by that you exactly know what the problem is that is different from you distributing questionnaires right or or even going to just ask them question but you yourself you already planted cassava and it did not grow that's very right good. you planted mango and everything went to waste so you are solving your own problem so just like what we're doing at pay you i'm solving a problem for myself as a car owner so if i solve it very well some other people will use it so as an agri tech try to get involved in that business itself you don't have to do the large scale home right just like do something that uh, is sizable mm. you exactly know the pain points of these people right even this um kidnap insurance or whatever it is we we're talking about you probably would not know a better way of of solving that problem rather than uh, uh going the way of uh high premium that would not be affordable yeah yeah, that, that's valid. Thank you very much, Tim Tokpe, for giving that insight. Um, Don't get kidnapped. It, <laughs> uh, it's, if, if maybe <laughs> that, that's weird. Uh, <laughs> like um, one of one of their fathers gets kidnapped. Then they, one of the co-founders. Yeah. No, no one. They will not, one of the honestly, co-founders. Will honestly, not let, go me, to the let me share with you guys. Okay. Honestly, I I used I used to have a farm in my hometown, right? And I mean, I am my uncle. Uh, we have we have like a we have like a farm where we rear where we rear cows, right? And all of a sudden, he called. I mean, the guy that manages the place called one time and said, "Oh, one other farmer, not too distance from our place, got kidnapped. The owner got kidnapped." Ah, I say kidnapped. Okay. That was the end of that. I say, see all the cow, the, my own that is there. You push help me sell it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> You see how these things have ripple effect yeah. in discouraging entrepreneurship, yeah. in getting people engaged in a legit job and all of that. So the problem really exists, right? And I believe very well that it is people who are involved in that space that can solve that problem. So yeah, you you will not find the co-founder on the farm. Probably a farmer uh, that has been contracted to take care of it. But yes, I think I agree with um, them having an idea of what goes on in the farm before going ahead with steps like this. And we've talked a lot about insurance and what Pula is doing. We'll keep our eyes out to see how this goes, this their intention goes. Um, we'll move from there to Starlink and... Um, the possibility of many of their subscribers in countries like Zimbabwe, Ghana, South Africa, Botswana might be disconnected because Starlink is having issue with the government. It seems like this happens every other market day, every three market days. Why are these regulatory challenges recurring? Yeah, uh, Starlink is facing issues in these countries where you've mentioned. In some of these countries, it has even been declared illegal, right? Uh, I think in Ghana, it has been declared illegal. And the situation the situation of things now is in many of these countries, people have been able to find, to get their hands on Starlink kits to use them, right? And Starlink has, you know, emailed all these people, emailed everyone basically that if you are using Starlink in unauthorized locations, uh, they will have to cut you off mm. right and the way around that is you can still use the roaming services but it seems like Starlink also wants to stop roaming services in these places so the issue in most of these locations is that there are regulatory problems Starlink needs to get a license before it can start operating in for example they got licensed in Nigeria before they started Kenya, in Zambia, and all these places, but um, they've not been able to get licenses in Ghana, uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Botswana. Yeah, Botswana, Cameroon. And the reason is um, all these countries have their reasons, right? Um, some make sense to me, some not really. Right. What are the ones that make sense? All right. So, for example, um, in Botswana, right, they said, is in Bo- yeah, in Botswana, um, they said, yeah, is it Bo- no, in Zimbabwe, they said the owner of Starlink is also the owner of Twitter. And then Twitter has been a platform 
that has been used to disparage <laughs> the government. <laughs> wow. So they're like, ah, this guy. <laughs> So you're the owner of the yeah. So you're the owner of that social media. They used to talk nonsense about us. I not do anything. Hey, come mm-hmm. and use your Stanley class. I can imagine. <laughs> so uh, that's the issue in Botswana. It's not really clear. Um, they said um, there are some things that Stanley did not declare. Like there are some information they did not provide. They were not straightforward to say, okay, what exactly are this information that did not provide, right? In South Africa, um, I think the issue is um, to get those licenses that you, that Starlink needs. Uh, I think there's this issue of 30 percent ownership of that company by right, underprivileged groups, yeah, and which is where I think Elon Musk or Starlink is not willing to budge, mm-hmm. right? So. These issues are there. In Cameroon, I think it's also a bit ridiculous. Or maybe they have a reason. So their own reason is, okay, um, if Starlink should come, it will threaten um, a player in the country, right? Why will it threaten that player? Because that player services, right? It's an internet service provider. Mm -hmm. Because their own services are not very good. And you know that... If, if they don't step, one. yes. If they don't step up, step, uh, step up, Starlink could take the market from them, which, in it's a way, fair, makes it's, it's kind of fair because it means that now that I know that I have competition, then I need to up. make my product Sorry, better. Sorry, is, is the is this existing player in Cameroon in any way backed by the government? So I think it's actually um, government owned. The possibility so is I. The, I think I think it's. <laughs> Who so, are you? so here's the thing they said. <laughs> um, it, the name is Camtel, right? And it is the um, so Camtel is like a um, national telecommunications and internet service provider. Okay. Right. So, so Starlink will come kind and of um, exactly compete with them. So it's I think um, you know sometimes when governments come up with regulation, we try to look at it from the angle of this is for the citizens. But as it's where it has if they are... In case of South Africa, I think it's it's kind of for the citizens. Yes. Uh, that kind of... Mix. How is it for the citizens? So if... I mean, they say 30% ownership by underprivileged groups. So they are just... it's To me, I don't know if, if I'm mistaken, but it's kind of a case of inclusion. So you want to operate in our company. In our country, you have so to have problem. somebody. I mean... Okay, this so, is not the place for it, Bobby. So I, I I just hope that um I don't know if there are gray areas that Starlink has been able to navigate to up to be operational in Nigeria as it were. Yeah, they've gotten their I mean Nigeria was if you remember very well, Nigeria was excited to have them. That was the time our dear president made that comment that we now have hundred <laughs> percent penetration. <laughs> penetration. So you know they don't have issues in Nigeria. I think right now, uh there was this interpoint report that showed that Starlink has actually overtaken some internet service providers when it comes to um the amount of market share mm-hmm. that they have. So Starlink is basically doing well. In Nigeria, so yeah, it is because I, I I was at a um Jumia store um some weeks back and I saw the truck that was used to deliver styling mm. kits. It's a lot, mm. it's a lot. I don't know if they are him just and for Lagos. So, but yeah, mm. a lot of people are using it. Here, but I'm just hoping that this <laughs> other people countries. Are, people want your president to believe you don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> I, should, just hope, I just hope. I just hope that um that those African countries find their way around it, right? Um, they need to because yeah. if you look at the benefits, so th- I think the benefits kind of outweighs some of the um the reasons for not allowing Starlink into those countries. So internet penetration, yes, it's getting better in Africa, but then there are still some places where they don't have it at all. And mm-hmm. Starlink can bring internet to those places since because it's of the yes, yeah, since it's satellite. So they should think about it. Ghana also declared it illegal. But then recently after this whole um subsea cable destruction and yeah. stuff they were now considering oh maybe Stalin could have filled in this gap yeah right, in the meantime point. and then they are now considering maybe you know allowing Stalin to operate so if you think about it 
internet is who does not need internet is yeah, yeah. the need we are. Yeah, we 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 are still going through the challenge of the, the st- damage subsidy yes, tables yes. even until now. So, now. Um, so I, I'm hoping that uh, Stanley finds his foot in these African countries. And uh, yes, we move to another very interesting story, which we promised you. No, Jim Gozumi promised you the last um, two weeks ago yes. uh, to give you um update on what... Sim Shagaya's Only Badger Fund is about. So he did an interview in the course of that week with him, and and he um, Chief Gwazini got a number of insights into the fund and other things that Sim is up to. So we're going to give you a brief one because we have both video and um, article Articles. to explain all this. So we're just going to give you a recap, and you can go and get it yourself. Chief Gwazini. Take it up. Over to you. Yes. <laughs> thank you for that. Okay. Thank you for so, having me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll start with the fund. Um, I get we, <coughs> we are basically spot on with most of what we said. Um, mm-hmm. Our analysis of why the, why it has the name it does. Um, there's a little story behind it as well. Um, you would want to. Okay, I'll tell you the story. Or you find out other things. But the story is that after he had been thinking of the name. He was telling his wife about it, and one day he's driving out of the office, mm-hmm. and he sees a man walking a honey badger. So honey walking, badger is a pet. Yes, yeah, so not country? exactly a pet in Nigeria, of course. Not exactly a pet, but um, looks like in the north or in some parts of the north. Oh, they yeah, use they it for that. like exhibitions or something like that. Uh, so as he drives out, animals, yeah. gets into traffic, he sees a guy walking a honey badger. So he's like, you know what? Maybe this is a sign. So let's go with this. But yeah, every other thing we said, the kind of entrepreneurs is correct. Um, the only thing I guess we didn't cover is like how many people. Um, he said we didn't know the number, but he's saying four or five entrepreneurs every every year so okay. that he has like hands-on experience. Mm. Um, he's also not raising a fund yet. He's going to be investing in personal funds. So oh. obviously it's going to be really early stage. And yeah, I mean, Maybe mainly, not mainly much early fund, stage. but more of mentoring and handholding. Mm, okay, yes. So more early stage um, investments. But yes, the, the mentoring is a big deal for him because mm-hmm. he mentions he mentioned that he l- just loves that process of helping people. And I mean, with 20 years of experience or 23 yeah. years of experience actually of building businesses in Nigeria, there's a whole lot you could learn from him. But moving on to the other parts of the conversation, we talked a, a extensively uh, about... Before you go to the other part of the conversation, we, we also mentioned how the current funding winter mm. might affect... Um, what he's um, going to do, what what he wants to do with the fund. But I think since you mentioned that it's not, it's only focusing on, on, on a very few number of people. Mm. I don't think that should impact it in any way. Um, I mean, not, ne- so the, the funding winter will impact everybody in one way or the other. Mm. It may not, be, so of course, for some people, it shows, it shows up in the fact that you can raise money as easily as it was. Mm-hmm. But for the, la- the most part, it's going to be the investment criteria is more stringent than it used to be. That's it's, it's going to affect everybody, regardless of how much you're investing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, moving on to the other parts of the conversation, um, one of the things we talked about was Conga. And I mean, everyone knows the story of Conga, how it started and all, but I guess what many people don't know, for example, is the fact that it nearly merged with Jumia in the early days. Um, that's something I didn't know about until he shared it. But he also talks about some of the things Conga had to do to gain market share. So he- heavily incentivizing um, customer acquisition, which, I mean, a lot of people have, st- have talked about it, criticized it, and all of that. And he concedes that, or he agrees that um, with the benefit of hindsight, it was not exactly the best path to take. Mm. But there's something else he says that I think is very, very important that um, people take away. In the heat of the moment, he didn't get any pushback from investors or from fellow entrepreneurs, everybody felt it was the right thing to do, mm-hmm. which is why, again, the value of what he wants to do is very, like, it's very obvious. He did not exactly have a lot of investors who were, at that time, who had a lot of experience in Africa. In fact, no, how many investors even had experience with um, investing in Africa in 2010, sorry, 2012, or between 2012 and 2015, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it shows us the importance of even investors having that experience because one, they can push back on some moves. I mean, of course, not uh, like aggressively, but they can tell yeah. you, look, what you're doing may not work because <laughs> you share the funny story. 
one of the investors told him, spend money, buy buy trucks, buy anything that you need. If the truck spoils, he said, pack it by the side of the road. <laughs> but that investor was one of the first people that said, we are not investing in 2015 when things got really tight. Mm. So I think it shows the value of having like investors that Sabi. So we get most of our funding from foreign VCs. Yeah. We need a lot more investors who are Africans or who have done business in Africa and understand and the, understand peculiarity the, of the peculiarities. Because someone in the US has always invested in the US, doesn't understand how the Nigerian consumer, for example, thinks. Probably what is given to an African um, startup is probably for charity. I mean, even it if it's not for like charity, charity, but the truth is that that knowledge gap is missing. And I think yeah. something else that um, doing that story showed me is the importance of uh, founders telling their stories, especially the more experienced you are, you need to share your stories. Because yeah, it's, it, it's, this, this took too long for Sim in my I own. I mean, well, maybe, I mean, of course, there were a lot of things that happened that probably, I mean, he, he started a company, another company um, soon after. Maybe um, no one, like, reached out to ask all those questions. Mm -hmm. But it's really important that experienced founders share their stories mm -hmm. because when you share these stories, people don't repeat the mistakes that you make. Mm -hmm. Because... At, I mean, it's a net positive for the ecosystem, right? You make a mistake in 2010, people should not be Maybe making those mistakes. Or at least, hopefully, they should not um, be making those mistakes in 2024 because now they have your example to follow. Mm -hmm. And it's something he mentioned. People have looked at the fact that he spent a lot of money acquiring customers in Conga mm -hmm. and newer um, e-commerce entrepreneurs are saying, okay, if we do this, we may not survive. And we may not even raise as much money as... Um, Conga did. did. So maybe we should look for better ways to acquire customers or to keep our customers. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's, it's really important that entrepreneurs share their stories. I mean, even if you're five years in, right? Um, the, where you are today is not where when you were, were when still you started. day one, as they say it. Oh, well, it's not but day yeah. one or anything. But <laughs> this, this is something, this is a conversation a that uh, keeps coming up. Um, earlier in the year, um, Justin and Osaru, Osaru yeah. Ruem. Um, Just Osaru, man. Osa <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry you for, can listen. To, you are listening name. to this. Sorry for modulating your name. And uh, they, they brought together um, start founders, executives in the startup space, and the media. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about these things about sharing stories, right? Yeah. It seems there's okay at the beginning at the beginning when the ecosystem was still budding people mm -hmm. were interested in sharing their story i think we're in that phase where people with other clip shots maybe we we'll evolve and get to another stage where founders that have now become og in quotes and have like a lot of experience in the bag would want to share their stories but she was doing is advising today that whatever so i'm not advising you, are, you i'm just suggesting so it's not as if i'm telling you what to do <laughs> Suggesting that no matter the stage you are, be willing to share your story, your failures, okay. your wins, and I'll the lessons. You do that. What, what have you built? <laughs> your lessons yeah. and uh, and and how how you've 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 put the lessons back into what you're doing to make it better. So that that, that is what we'll be ending with today. Don't forget to watch the interview and also read the insight that we've generated from the interview on the tech point. Africa website. You can also find other stories on the website of things that happened that have happened in the course of this week of April 15th. Yes, you can and also other stories. Um thank you for joining us once again today. We have our newsletters that are still on if you're not yet subscribed, you are missing out. Tech Point Digest is there. Over thirty thousand subscribers receive a newsletter between five a five o'clock, five AM and um six AM West African time every weekday. And um, you might want to be part of them to listen or to know about what is going on in the African tech space. We also have Equity Merchant that discusses everything around startups and investment. Modern Workplace Newsletter is also there that um, focuses on employers, HR professionals, managers, and anybody that is uh, managing people. 
uh, you might also want to subscribe to that to get insight on what is going on and also expert contribution. Thank you for joining us once again. And um, thank you to Timmy Tokpe that joined us um, to discuss insurance on the podcast. Please don't forget to leave us a review. If you're listening to this on Spotify, please don't forget to rate us and give us a review so that other subscribers, other users can also find us if you're listening to us on or if you find us on any of the social media platforms don't forget to drop your comments and feedback you can also send your feedback to podcast at techpoint.africa podcast at techpoint.africa catch you in the next one bye bye